Israel has begun pumping manufactured fresh water uphill, forcing it back into the Sea of Galilee, a man-made reversal so extreme it defies natural hydrology. Supporters call it visionary. Critics warn it could destabilize the region. How did this lake become the center of the most radical water experiment on Earth? There's a red line painted on the rocks of the Sea of Galilee. If the water drops below it, everything stops. This lake is Israel's largest freshwater source, supplying drinking water to millions, irrigating roughly 40% of the country's agriculture and under treaty obligations, delivering around 50 million cubic meters of water every year to Jordan. But that red line is not symbolic. It's the shutdown threshold. Drop below it and pumps go offline. Farms lose water, treaties strain. The entire region feels the shock. And for decades, Israel was pushing that line closer every single year. 1950s Israel was a water crisis waiting to happen. More than half the country was desert. Communities survived on water trucked in from the north. Without a new national water source, the young state wasn't just vulnerable, it was in existential trouble. So in 1964, Israel launched the National Water Carrier, an artificial river of tunnels, pipes, and canals designed to pull fresh water from the Sea of Galilee and drive it into the desert. Water was pumped over mountains, then carried by gravity through valleys. It was one of the most audacious water transfers attempted in the Middle East. Farmland spread where dunes had stood for centuries. Agricultural exports grew, towns took root. Much of the country came to depend on this single water artery. The desert became an economic engine, but every drop came from one place, the Sea of Galilee. And year after year, the lake paid the price. By the 1990s, the warning signs were impossible to ignore. The national water carrier was pulling more water from the Sea of Galilee than rainfall could replace. Satellite imagery told the story, shoreline retreating, coves drying, beaches turning to cracked earth. Docks stood hundreds of meters from the water's edge. Then came years of drought. The lake slipped toward the red line, where pumping becomes unreliable, and the black line below it, where everything shuts down. Farmers saw allocations shrink. Backup aquifers started failing. Experts recorded drops exceeding two meters per year. By the late 2000s, the lake was approaching collapse. The 1994 treaty with Jordan which relies on the lake's outflow, was at risk. Regional tensions escalated. Below the black line, pumps stop, agriculture stalls, cities lose supply. Israel was facing the possibility that its most important freshwater source could die. By the early 2000s, Israel was running out of time. The Sea of Galilee was collapsing, aquifers failing. The only way forward? create an entirely new water source, one not tied to rainfall or rivers. So Israel turned to the Mediterranean. Along the coast, massive desalination plants began to rise. Industrial complexes built to pull seawater from the Mediterranean and strip the salt out using high-pressure reverse osmosis. Seawater was forced through microscopic membranes, separating freshwater from brine. Each plant consumed power equivalent to a small city, but engineering innovation made large-scale production viable. By 2015, desalination was the backbone of Israel's water supply. Five mega plants along the coast, including Sorek, producing 150 million cubic meters annually, now generate over 600 million cubic meters per year. 80% of Israel's drinking water. Israel was manufacturing its own water. As the plants expanded, Israel produced more fresh water than needed. Scarcity became surplus, and that surplus led to a decision no nation had ever attempted, reversing an entire water system. Israel finally produced more fresh water than it consumed. 
Now, it had a surplus and a shrinking lake on the verge of collapse. So engineers proposed something no nation had ever attempted, forcing water back into the Sea of Galilee. This wasn't a simple pipe job. It meant reversing the national water carrier, built in the 1960s to move water one way, lake to desert. Now, water had to travel the opposite direction, desalinated on the coast, pumped inland, lifted over mountains, then dropped into a lake hundreds of meters below sea level. Israel built a vast reverse carrier network, 100 to 150 kilometers of pipes, pumps, and reservoirs linking coastal plants to the lake. The overhaul cost a billion shekels, close to $300 million. Engineers describe it as a pipeline superhighway designed to push up to 5,000 cubic meters of water an hour at first, with plans to triple that as more infrastructure comes online. That's the equivalent of refilling several Olympic-sized swimming pools every hour, all of it pushed uphill against gravity. Infrastructure from the 1960s was never meant for reverse pressure. Engineers reinforced weak points that could rupture, a major failure could flood valleys or damage towns. They flipped the switch anyway. Today, desalinated water from Ashdod and Hadera runs inland, climbs in elevation, then descends toward the lake. Pumps hum on the coast, pipelines snake through hills, control centers track pressure and flow in real time. A national water artery now runs in two directions, Desalination plants supply 600 to 700 million cubic meters annually, 80% of drinking water, while the reverse carrier sends surplus north to stabilize the lake above the danger lines. Heavy rains in the late 2000s had already shown how quickly the lake can change. In two winters, its level jumped by more than six meters, coming within a few dozen centimeters of full capacity. Now, with desalinated water able to top it up and stop the slide during future droughts, the Sea of Galilee finally has a fighting chance at long-term recovery. But as the water level climbed and the pipelines proved they could run in reverse, a different concern surfaced, one that no engineering calculation could fully resolve. Not everyone sees this as a miracle. Israeli ecologists warn that pumping manufactured freshwater into a natural lake carries risks that may only appear over years. The lake's ecosystem evolved with specific mineral balances and seasonal cycles. Desalinated water, stripped to H2O, then remineralized, is not identical to the spring and river water it has known for millennia. Environmental scientists point to fault lines, Changing inflows could alter nutrient levels. Algae blooms could spread. Fish species might struggle if salinity drifts outside their range. And because the Jordan River depends on outflow from the Sea of Galilee, any ecological shock here could ripple downstream into other communities and habitats. No country has ever done this at this scale. Israel is writing the rule book in real time Supporters inside the Water Authority counter with data. The inflow is monitored continuously, quality is adjusted before release, and so far, surveys have not shown major ecological damage. Some reports even note that to this point, scientists have seen no significant harm from the new inflow, only a system that still needs close watching. Critics reply that once a lake becomes dependent on artificial inflow, there's no going back. If desalination plants suffer a major disruption from economics, energy shortages, or conflict, the Galilee could be pushed back toward crisis, only this time with an ecosystem adapted to a new normal. The safety net could become another point of vulnerability, and that leads to the next fault line. If changing the fate of a single lake can reshape local ecosystems, what happens when the same water system also underpins treaties, borders, and power across the Middle East? For Israel, the Sea of Galilee was never just a lake, it was leverage. 
Under the 1994 treaty, Israel supplies Jordan 50 million cubic meters annually, a lifeline for one of the world's most water-scarce nations. By 2021, that doubled to over 100 million as Jordan's deficit deepened. On paper, it's cooperation. In practice, it means something simple. One country controls the tap, another has to live with whatever comes out. In the 1960s, Arab states tried to divert the Jordan River's headwaters. Israel responded with artillery and airstrikes. Those water skirmishes helped push the region toward the 1967 war. Today, the battlefield looks different, but the physics of power haven't changed. Israel's cities now drink desalinated water, but Jordan's farms and Palestinian communities downstream still depend on water released from the lake on decisions made upstream. With the reverse carrier in place, Israel can stabilize the lake while also deciding how much flows south, how much is sold, and on what terms. Supporters say that makes the entire region more resilient. A stronger Israel can be a more reliable supplier. Critics see a different picture. In a part of the world where borders are disputed and trust is fragile, tying basic survival to a neighbor's pumps is a dangerous kind of dependency. In a region where wars once started over attempts to divert a river, Israel has quietly built something even more powerful, the ability to generate its own water, protect its main lake, and still sit at the center of its neighbor's water security. And that raises a larger question, far beyond the Middle East. What Israel is doing isn't just a local fix. It's a prototype. Countries are watching. Saudi Arabia produces 20% of the world's desalinated water. Jordan is building its own multi-billion dollar plant at Aqaba to pump water hundreds of kilometers to Amman, a mirror of what Israel has done. Outside the region, Spain, Cyprus, California, Australia, all building desal plants pushing water inland. On one level, the logic is seductive. If the climate won't cooperate, engineer around it. Build machines big enough to ignore the sky. But desalination is energy hungry. More water means more power burned. And unless that power is clean, you feed the climate shifts that made desalination necessary. Every plant also has to dump concentrated brine back into the sea raising questions about long-term impacts on coastal ecosystems. The Sea of Galilee becomes a global test case. If Israel can stabilize a natural lake with manufactured water, what happens when dozens of nations attempt the same at massive scale? Does it become a fragile, high-tech safety net that buys time? Or a new layer of dependence on energy systems, coastal ecosystems, and political stability that are themselves under stress? Israel's reversal of the Galilee doesn't answer that question. It poses it for every water-stressed country now looking at the Mediterranean, the Red Sea, or any ocean, and wondering if the real future of fresh water is no longer in the clouds, but in the pipes. Israel's water reversal became an export. As the Sea of Galilee stabilized, countries began asking not for water, but for blueprints. In California, the Carlsbad desalination plant, the largest in the Western Hemisphere, was built using reverse osmosis technology developed by Israeli engineers. In India, states facing groundwater collapse are adopting Israeli water recycling systems and digital monitoring grids. Innovations created during decades when Israel had to track every drop this expertise became Israel's new commodity. Not oil, not gas, water engineering. It's a sector generating billions annually. From designing desalination plants, to AI-powered leak detection, to managing national water grids. A country once defined by drought now sells solutions to nations struggling with the same crisis it once faced alone. Global demand keeps rising. What Israel built for survival the world sees as a roadmap.
Israel's reversal of the Sea of Galilee is bigger than one lake, bigger than one country, and bigger than one project. It's the story of a nation that refused to accept the limits of geography and engineered its way out of a crisis that once seemed inevitable. It solved a water shortage that threatened its future, revived a lake on the brink of collapse, and, in doing so, reshaped the politics of an entire region. But the solution comes with consequences. A lake now partially sustained by manufactured water, a region whose stability depends on pumps, pipelines, and trust, and a planet edging toward a future where natural freshwater sources can no longer keep up. Israel didn't just rewrite its water system, it rewrote what every country thought possible when the climate turns hostile. Whether that future becomes sustainable or fragile will depend on choices we haven't yet made. Because the real question isn't just how Israel reversed the flow of its water system, it's whether the rest of the world is ready to follow. So here's the real question. Is Israel's water reversal a blueprint for survival or a warning about the future cost of engineering around nature? Drop your take in the comments and hit subscribe.